I'm Adrian Wisnicki, and I'm one of the co-founders and organizers of the Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom Project. I'm really pleased to welcome you to the Zoomcast. As one of the different forms of content that we're generating for this site, these Zoomcasts are meant to be a mechanism that will allow us to stage conversations where we can think together about our classroom practices and our processes of learning and unlearning as teachers. It's a space where we can hope that we can think about how we can grow together as a community of scholars and learn from one another, especially as we're all undertaking the work of undisciplining and moving beyond the boundaries of our fields and our training. Today, I'm joined by three individuals. Kira Brahm, who recently completed her PhD in English at Vanderbilt University, and will join the faculty of the Louisiana School for Math, Science, and the Arts this coming fall. Indu Ohri, who is a preceptor and the current Eccles Fellow in the University of Virginia's English Department. And Bree Simpson, who is a doctoral candidate and teaching assistant in the English Department at York University in Toronto. Together today, we'll be discussing the processes and objectives by which we developed the lesson plan cluster on Mary Seacole and the Caribbean published by the Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom Project. Our discussion will serve two purposes. It will ultimately become one of the Zoomcasts presented on our project site, and it will also serve as our roundtable discussion for the Victorian Popular Fiction Association 2021 conference. Okay, so I'd like to begin by just saying thank you to Indu, Kira, and Bree for joining us today for this discussion and really begin with a simple question uh, that focuses on your initial interest in the Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom project and how you, each of you, became involved in this project. So is there anyone that would like to begin uh, 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 with an answer to this question? Okay, Kira, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And, and thanks for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I, I came to this project uh, to undiscipline the Victorian classroom uh, at a time where I was really thinking about the questions at the heart of the project myself uh, as, as a teacher. And so uh, I'm getting ready. I'm just coming out of grad school. And in grad school, I was teaching kind of writing intensive intro to lit classes. I wasn't teaching British literature. Um, so I'm going to start in the fall for the first time teaching a British literature survey. And so I'm asking myself the exact same questions that this project is asking, which is how can I foreground anti-racist pedagogy in my classrooms? How can I exercise in, in a truly trans-imperial approach to teaching British literature? So all these questions that were in my head are the same questions that we've been going over together uh, as, as a group. So it's been really wonderful. Oh, well, that's that's excellent to hear. Thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, is, is there anyone that would like to follow on from Kira? Um, sure, I will. So thank you, Adrian, for your introduction. And thank you, Kira. Um, so I became interested in undisciplining the Victorian classroom after reading the article Undisciplining Victorian Studies last summer. So I have taught Mary Prince and Mary Seacole before in my British literature classes, and I have taught global anglophone classes of the long 19th century, but most of those syllabi were still focused on white canonical Victorian authors. And I was really intrigued by this idea of changing the way that we teach Victorian studies to focus on authors of color. And I really wanted to be part of this um, initiative. So when I saw the call for scholars to join Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom, I signed up and I said that I had read both of these authors. And a few months later, Adrian contacted me and asked if I'd like to join the Caribbean subgroup. And I said yes, because I'm just really excited at all of our work in foregrounding um, authors of color like Prince and Seacole from this region. Okay, excellent. Well, th thank you for sharing that as well. I mean, it's it's really interesting to hear this in some ways because you know it, it, we, we've been working together for, I guess maybe eight nine months, quite quite a bit amount of time, and and I'm starting to kind of, like it, as time has passed, so it's kind of interesting to kind of remember some of the early discussions we had in this project, uh, about what, why you all were interested. Okay, Bree. So uh, you're the only one we haven't heard from yet. W would you like to say a little bit about how you became interested in the Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom project? Uh, what drew you to the project, and so forth? 
Thank you, Adrian, and uh, thank you, Indu and Kira. For... Um, yes, so as a, a graduate student who's very interested in pedagogy, both in my department and in other areas, um, one thing that drew me to this project was the opportunity to specifically engage with how do we undertake the process of uh, anti-racist pedagogy, how do we undertake the process of talking about empire and talking about colonialism in the fields that we're engaging with. Um, for example, my background comes from both, uh, studied, first started studying classics and humanities and then eventually English with my PhD. But in both the field, those fields, in count, um, particularly my research, but also my work as a teaching assistant, um, the focus being very much on the traditional you know, classical canon or the traditional um, white uh, male author texts in the Victorian period um, and starting to bring in other voices and other texts, but them very much being a sort of tacked on extra at the end of the unit or at the end of the course and having conversations in my tutorials with my students about the way other ways to engage with some of the texts and um, other ways to bring in the different voices that are sometimes present within the text we were reading, but weren't being uh, foregrounded or focused on by the discussions that we were having. So I've, and I've been a teaching assistant for seven years now. So those conversations are ones that I've been having since I first started back in 2014, but they're just conversations that are starting to um, filter into the workshops and, and things on how to, um, how to introduce these discussions and tutorials in the past year or two. So being able to be part of a project that um, engages directly with those questions at, from particularly from a pedagogical uh, STEM perspective, uh, rather than focusing particularly on introducing those ideas of scholarship was something I was very excited about being part of. And it's been a really wonderful opportunity and experience to work with all of you. Okay, excellent. Well, well that's, that's really great to hear. And I, I obviously can't complain with you enjoying the experience. Uh, the, the one thing I should mention is there's, there's one colleague on the project, Heidi Kaufman, who's an associate professor of English at the University of Oregon, who's not joining us. Uh, Heidi has chosen to, instead of being in part of the Zoomcast with us, to provide a written statement. Uh, so that will be shared alongside of the video. Uh, but it's also wor worth noting in this context, you know, listening to all of your answers, that our project really focuses on teaching and pedagogy. Uh, uh, all of us, like, like many in the field of Victorian studies, were really inspired by the uh, Undisciplining Victorian Studies article. Uh, but one thing that I think really kind of sets this project apart, the Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom project, is our focus on pedagogy. Uh, a lot of initiatives that were inspired by that groundbreaking article are really focused on research. But I've, I've really felt like, and, 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 you know, and I think you, you've all shared this feeling as, and the, the co-founders of the project have shared this feeling with me as well. Like we really like thinking about uh, how our teaching and pedagogy should be changed because it's so foundational to the kind of work we do, uh, to the, the way we kind of nurture and develop our students, and really to the kind of ideas we give to them that they take forth into the world and you know, apply to all kinds of different contexts, all kinds of different literatures, all kinds of different historical periods. Uh, so, so obviously a major outcome of the work that the, 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 four of, the five of us have been doing over the last, uh, you know, uh, I guess eight, nine, 10 months, is uh, we developed a set of uh, four lesson plans focused on Mary Seacole and the Caribbean. And these lesson plans became one of the stars of the show of our recent launch of the uh, first edition of the Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom project site. So I thought it might be really useful as part of our talk for each of you to say just a little bit about what your lesson plan is focused on. Is there somebody that would like to go first and? Uh, you know, st start off this part of our discussion? Sure, I can go first. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, Adrian, for uh, saying that point. So my lesson plan uh, focused on uh, Mary Seacole's role and work as a medical professional um, and focused on questions of decentering and uh, attempting to decolonize medical knowledge and particularly how uh, medical knowledge is taught within the field, um, both uh, looking at um, how is this knowledge is so often framed through both a Eurocentric and a colonial and a masculine lens. Um, and thinking about uh, Mary Seacole's positioning in both the, the history of nursing, but also the practice of nursing, how she was um, received as 
both her work as a nurse at the time and how her the legacy of her work has been um, received both in the general public knowledge today, but also how she's been taught within uh, nur the nursing um, pedagogy, but also within the wider pedagogy in medical schools, for example, and the differences that there are in, in those contexts. Um, and also thinking about uh, the different ways, um, the, how Sequel as a figure can um, cast a light on the different um, inequalities in um, both medical knowledge and um, medical practice and our, how that um, continues to influence who is able to access medical care today. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, I, I, I mean, that's really interesting to hear. And, you know, uh, one thing that your answer is really highlighting uh, and this is true for all the lesson plans, is, is both kind of the really interdisciplinary nature of the, the lesson plans that you all have created and the way that these lesson plans cut across time, different kinds of materials, different kinds of critical perspectives. Uh, would, would one of the other two people, uh, either Indu or Kira, like to tell us a little bit about uh, their lesson plan? Maybe we can just go in reverse order and Indu, you could go yeah, next, do, yeah. and followed by Kira. <laughs> Sure. Um, so my lesson plan is called Recentering Nursing in Wartime, and it focuses on the emergence, development, and modernization of female nursing in mid-19th century military conflicts, specifically the Crimean War and the American Civil War. So I chose to focus on this topic because I wanted to take this so-called rivalry between Seacole and Nightingale that has emerged in recent scholarship and look at the bigger picture of female nursing. So I thought by examining the broader historical context of women's roles in wartime nursing that students could get a more accurate picture of Seacole and Nightingale and their relation to this professional field. So I knew I wanted to take a transatlantic look at nursing because I knew that it had developed in England and America during the mid-19th century and one of the scholars I read early on when I was doing research said it was funny that we focused so much on the American Civil War and not the Crimean War when they're both really similar in some ways and they take uh, place in um, the mid 19th century. So I ended up finding out that the development of female nursing was actually transnational in scope. It's not just transatlantic because you get all women from all these diverse backgrounds from Ireland, England, Jamaica, France, Russia, Sardinia, um, were all serving as nurses during the Crimean War. So this is truly a transnational conflict that Sequel and Nightingale were involved in. And I also wanted to compare Sequel's work as a Black female nurse with other nurses who face similar class, racial, and gender discrimination. And I figured they must have served during the American Civil War. And I found that um, African-American women like Harriet Tubman and Susie Taylor King, who has written an absolutely wonderful autobiography, worked as nurses for the Union Army. So I think they are very complementary to Seacole in the classroom. And finally, I was also really interested in um, this idea of heroism because Seacole says she wants to be a Crimean heroine. A lot of people referred to Nightingale and other nurses um, like Clara Barton as angels or um, heroes. And uh, there's a gender reversal because women emerge as heroes of these conflicts and male soldiers are very vulnerable and wounded and victimized. So I was also interested in the effective dimensions of these relationships as well. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's, it's very interesting to kind of hear about, you, you know, your lesson plan, especially kind of from this more abstract way, because obviously for a lot of the collaboration, we were all really in the weeds and kind of looking at different elements of it. And one thing that really strikes me is the kind of, you know, well, the comparative dimension, right? Thinking about uh, Seacole in relation to Florence Nightingale, but also in terms of history, right? Uh, the, the, the American Civil War, the Crimean War. Uh, so anyway, it's just very interesting to hear about that. Uh, Kira, I think that you're the only one we haven't heard yet, uh, fr from whom we haven't yet heard about your lesson plan. Would you like to tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my lesson plan is called Decentering Britishness. Uh, and it begins with the assumption that anytime we teach British literature, um, we have to discuss with our students uh, what the term British means. Um, and I think that's that's part of kind of what what undisciplining the Victorian classroom is doing um, sort of at, at large. And, and so I sort of took this and, and focused it in um, 
on Seacole, who's an amazing figure uh, in terms of just her liminality uh, as a woman of color, uh, as a Jamaican, she offers these great opportunities to challenge the idea that there's anything like a stable identity category known as British. Um, and so that's really what I wanted to, to focus on in my pathway. Uh, and so part of that is thinking a little bit about how she's represented in the 19th century, how she self represents, um, but then also thinking about the ways in which she is represented now um, and, and her legacy. And so, um, you know, she's, she's become a very celebrated, maybe one of the most celebrated Black Britons. Um, and so a lot of what, what my pathway does is it thinks about um, what does it mean to call Seacole a Black Briton um, as, as a woman of color, as, as a woman who was Jamaican born, right? What does it mean to give her that category? Um, and one of the questions, so there's a speech that I include by a Caribbean historian, Vereen Shepherd. And, and she's, she's challenging uh, C. Cole's sort of definition as, as Black British. Um, and she asks, so what makes C. Cole British rather than Jamaican? And she says, if, if the classification is just that one was born in pre-independence Jamaica, then does that make Tacky a Black Briton, right? Does that make Sam Sharp a Black Briton, right? they don't get called that. So, so it's, so the whole pathway is sort of about thinking, thinking Seacole in her own time and thinking Seacole now. Mm -hmm. well, well, I think what's interesting here is so, so obviously your focus is on Seacole, uh, but some of the questions you raise really have a much wider resonance, you know, especially in, in relation to identity. Uh, the, the other thing that's worth noting and that your, your answer really brought out is there is a very strong contemporary focus to mm -hmm. our lesson plans. And one of the ways that, in fact, that kind of contemporary dimension is accentuated is that all of the lesson plans have an actual subsection that lists out some contemporary themes, uh, which might be taught alongside the critical and primary materials that are featured in each lesson plan. Uh, on this topic too, it might be worth just saying a few things about, you know, so when we present these lesson plans as we are in this video, they seem, well, they are, but they, they come across as these fully developed uh, entities that kind of just sprung out of our minds, right? But the reality is we went through a very complex process in developing these lesson plans. Uh, it was a very iterative process. It was a very collaborative process. It was a process that really uh, involved uh, thinking th together to develop the overall structure of the lesson plans. Uh, and so I, I wondered if we might just say a few things about, you know, the overall process of how we did this, right? Uh, were there particular elements or are there particular elements of the process that you all feel are worth emphasizing either just to kind of illuminate how we arrived at these lesson plans or even as a way of kind of sharing with others uh, who might be interested in developing their own lesson plans, how we kind of, uh, you know, week to week uh, in collaboration uh, created these plans? If it's all right with everyone, I'd like to start with this question. Sure. So um, I think there were three parts of the collaboration that I recall. So we worked together on the format of the lesson plans, like what would they actually look like? And that developed organically throughout the process as we were gathering resources together and trying to figure out where they would go. There was also the peer review of our work. So I think we received peer review from two other members throughout this process. And there was also the design of the website itself. So we worked together to choose the, the pictures and the format and the design. And I would just like to focus on the peer view of my lesson plan. I think that was my favorite part of the entire collaboration um, was the peer review because I got to hear um, two different perspectives on my lesson plan that, that really helped me to shape it. Um, so it was peer reviewed by Heidi, who um, is not here, but, um, and Heidi's perspective was very valuable because she had an outsider's perspective on my lesson plan. She didn't know anything about um, the development of nursing during the 19th century. So she was able to comment on my lesson plan like um, someone who might be visiting the undisciplining Victorian classroom website. And if they're just coming to this material fresh, what would they think? 
And then my listing plan was also peer reviewed by Bree. And both of us were uh, working on similar topics of sequel and nursing. So I found Bree's advice really helpful because she could give me the perspective of someone who was doing research in um, a similar field and that was more tailored to my research. So I found both perspectives um, integral to shaping the final product. And um, I just really loved getting such in-depth and careful comments on my lesson plan. So um, without a doubt, that was my favorite part. Mm -hmm. no, that, that's fantastic to hear. And, and you know, as kind of one of the, the founding uh, developers of the project, uh, th this, this, this element, the peer review, is something that I think we're all really proud of in that uh, we're really interested in breaking down various kinds of hierarchies, breaking down various kinds of boundaries that exist in the academy. Uh, and often these kinds of boundaries and hierarchies uh, really kind of work against scholars at, especially you know, early career scholars like all of you are, uh, at, in a disadvantageous way. And so our project is really interested in kind of championing the work of early career scholars, of junior scholars, of uh, graduate students, of independent scholars, of contingent faculty. Uh, and one of the ways that we've really done that is through the peer review process. We have an open peer review process. Um, and the process really focuses on one, kind of making people responsible for the feedback that they provide. And, and that obviously through an open process, you, everyone knows, you know, the, the people involved in any uh, given set of kind of items that are being peer reviewed, everyone knows who they are. And so there's a kind of uh, responsibility that that generates to provide uh, constructive feedback, to provide feedback that's supportive. Uh, and I think in, in our process that really came out. So the way obviously this worked is each of you would kind of draft an iteration of your lesson plan once we got go going. And then we had a, a series of kind of um, weeks where you were working individually with another member of the group to develop your lesson plan. And then ultimately after that, there were still kind of layers of, of what might be called the lighter peer review or everyone else in the group that hadn't kind of, you know, officially peer reviewed your piece uh, was uh, also looking at it, providing feedback and so forth. Um, are there any kind of so 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 you know in into said of the peer review process? Are, are there any other components of the process that uh, uh, either Bree or Kira you, you feel like are particularly worth emphasizing as unique to this project or particularly uh, useful or helpful? Um, uh, I just I'll just say briefly first um, that the part um, both the peer review but also just the collaborative element of the project overall, particularly the Zoom meetings, you know, we met um, every two weeks pretty consistently for the last six or eight months, as Adrian was mentioning, and having that um, consistent uh, meetings at, at a set time, but also um, with the same group of people and being able to just both get to know each other, but also grow the project as we were getting to know each other and our process and how we work best together and being able to work with different members of the group individually and then they're coming back to the group, group together. That isn't um, a collaborative process that I, or kind of collaborative process I had participated in before. And I found it um, probably one of the most rewarding aspects of the project was to see how that affected both my own ideas developing, um, for example, um, the echo what Indu was saying about the uh, Peer review process. I found our discussions um, of just the two of us when we were working on that part of the peer review process. Um, in terms of developing uh, the clarity of our lesson plans and also developing the, the specific ways that um, these are the different ways you can approach the particular part of, um, you know, looking at SQL as a nurse, but in different contexts, but also within that, um, the, each of our lesson plans as individual sort of these are different approaches that you could take to um, apply a syllabus or a teaching course. So developing all of that and um, particularly because we were approaching this all as both as uh, teachers or in, interested in pedagogy, but also as scholars. As, so it very much felt like a research project at some point, you know, when I was working on it myself, it was very much the same way I would approach researching a chapter in my dissertation or uh, the conference presentation. I was you know, starting looking for resources and then thinking about the ideas. So having that collaborative um, element, even though we weren't 
specifically presenting, you know, we didn't um, do a case study of it in any of our classes, for example, or present it specifically to students to get that kind of feedback. But um, having that collaboration where we were able to see different perspectives on it and um, have different discussions about the elements and, and also the number of times that enabled us to revise and develop the project, I found that really helped to shift the focus even just in my, my own thought process and my own argumentation processes and research um, that this is for, um, both a, as a pet is a pedagogical project as well as a, so I found that a very, very rewarding part of the project. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a great point to emphasize, right? Like, so in, in theory, we were, we were producing lesson plans and engaging in pedagogical work, but there was a lot of research involved. Uh, and, you know, one thing that I've kind of heard across your answers already, you know, and what we've been saying today is how much you all are learning, right? And how, you know, yeah. not only kind of the way you are approaching a particular topic in the classroom is changing, but how intellectually, uh, conceptually, you are reconceiving the actual subject matter that you're teaching. And this is obviously going to kind of not only influence your teaching, but also your, your research. Uh, Kira, how about you? W were there elements of the process that you particularly found, um, I don't know, uh, that you really enjoyed? I mean, I'll just say quickly, I think Brie kind of already alluded to this, but for me, one of the most productive parts was differentiating four unique pathways. Because we kind of began, we we had, you know, we, we each had sort of ideas, but we found uh, that I think like Heidi's and my pathway were, were a little bit too similar and maybe like Indu and Breed's pathways were maybe a little bit too close. And so we got together and we thought about like, okay, what do we really want to say? Like, like these, we, we have the sense that these are two unique positions. These are two unique approaches. So how do we articulate that? And that for me was really, really, you know, interesting and helpful work. And so when Heidi and I got together, she ended up doing, she was initially working on kind of intersectionality and identity. And so she ended up actually uh, doing this amazing pathway on Victorian autobiography. Uh, and, and so it, it's, you know, it, it was just a really great, and that came out of our, you know, conversation that, that we had together, um, just in an attempt to create these kind of unique approaches. And that, that for me was really exciting and fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, and absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, at the end of the process, I feel like we've come out with four very distinct and, yeah, unique and important so. uh, lesson plans, right? Uh, but yeah, when we began, it was like, well, we're going to work on SQL, right? Uh, and, you know, that's a, that's a huge topic, and it can also feel like a small topic at the same time. Uh, and, you know, in, in this, you know, on this topic, I mean, so the, the way I, I originally kind of approached you all is each of you in, in uh, we had originally put out a call kind of before our the, the collaboration of the four of us, five of us began uh, looking for scholars who are interested in being part of the Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom Project and uh, in particular who are interested in um, developing lesson plans. Each of you came forward and each of you identified both Mary Prince and Mary Seacole uh, as potential areas of interest. And that was one of the things that that kind of uh, made me uh, reach out to each of you is that, you know, I wasn't sure which, which direction we would go, but the particular interest you had identified gave me at least two options. Uh, but we ended up focusing on Mary Seacole. So a, a good question that we might address, even if only briefly, is why focus on Seacole, right? Why not Mary Prince, or for that matter, any other writer uh, from the Caribbean, from the Victorian era? I think we decided early on, maybe from the first or second meeting, that we wanted to focus on Sequel first for several reasons. I mean, for me, Sequel has a very multifaceted personality. I mean, uh, whenever I've been rereading her memoir several times as I've been working on this lesson plan, and I'm so impressed that she was such a go-getter who worked very hard to fulfill her ambition. She quit no matter how hard it got. Um, and I remember I was reading, I think, Carol Helmstetter's book on um, the women who were involved with the Crimean War. And it turned out that there were three um, Black women who applied to be nurses in Nightingale's party, and all three of them were rejected. And it looks as though it probably was for um, racial reasons, um, because they were very... Um, they had a lot of experience in nursing. So 
even when she was rejected and everyone told her no, she still went to the Crimea herself. So she's just a very impressive person. Uh, she also had this very adventurous life. I mean, she traveled around the world. She served in the Crimean War. And as Kira mentioned, um, she became a celebrity in England. Um, and she also wrote this autobiography of her experiences that fits into so many different contexts. I mean, you can read it as um, the story of a Black Briton, as Kira mentioned, or um, a story about nursing history, as Brie looks at, or women's autobiography, as Kira mentions, or even a wartime memoir, like my lesson plan touches on. I mean, it's just so, uh, such a rich and um, deep text. Mm -hmm. No, no, absolutely. I mean, so, so, so for you, you know, the answer, the, the question why sequel really leads to answer an answer that involves sequel, but also involves her text. Um, so it, uh, there's one, you know, we're, we're running out of time, but there is one point that I wanted to kind of come back to and underscore, and, and this also goes to something you said earlier, Brie, uh, which was the collegiality of our process, right? Like, I think it would be fair to say that all of us really found the uh, process of collaborating to be highly enriching, uh, highly pleasant, uh, highly rewarding, you know, choose your adjective. Uh, in, in my particular case, uh, I found that we would often have very long meetings as we were discussing our lesson plans, and I wouldn't even notice because I was so uh, uh, caught up in the conversation, uh, it, you know, and I was learning a lot from working with you all, but it was just such a pleasant experience as well to, to be collaborating with you all. And so, uh, you know, speaking from the kind of perspective of the Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom project, one thing we'd obviously like to do, whether it's you know in, in the the work that you all will subsequently be doing for the project or in other collaborations, is foster a similar kind of collegiality and collaborative spirit. And so, in closing, I was wondering, you know, if 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 each of you could maybe just say a few things uh, about advice you might have based on our collaboration for others, things you've learned from working in our collaboration that you think could be especially well uh, transported into other collaborative contexts and would make those contexts uh, as successful as ours has been. So yeah, so if you could just say a little bit about that, you know, lessons learned, advice, uh, especially with a kind of focus about thinking about like the elements that made our, our collaboration successful. I can start just sure, very briefly. Ahead. I think one of the things, and we've we've all of our um, answers and discussion have touched on this, but approach starting the project off, like at the first meeting or the first discussion, from a place of openness, from a place of curiosity, but also from a place where all of the voices, all of the people in the group are able to to both con contribute, but also determine what direction the pro the that particular project the group will work on will be going. So even when we're talking about when started out with these are the two um, we might look at Mary Prince or we might look at Mary C. Cole, even in just the and what aspects, you know, deciding to each look at one pathway rather than just focusing on one aspect of a person of that particular person, or even the fact we decided to start with um, a figure, a person uh, rather than a uh, historical figure, rather than starting with uh, an area, like I think we discussed briefly, also mm -hmm. looking more broadly at Caribbean things like that. So Having all of those discussions and um, over the course of, I think it was two or three meetings to um, one or two meetings to, to come up with all of those ideas. I think the, those were where both the, the sort of the collaboration and the um, collegiality, the spirit of um, friendliness. And I think that's where all that, um, as we got to know each other, that's where all that began and that continued on once we'd set that precedent. In place. Mm -hmm. so I think that helped encourage the, the friendliness and the openness but I think it also that those first couple of meetings were essential parts of determining what our pathways or what our lesson plans ended up looking like. And, and like those were some of, at least I found for myself, some of the notes I took from those meetings and the um, things I noted down to look up or things I, I noted down as were things that I ended up expanding on or using or being invaluable to the later stages of the project. So starting with those Zoom meetings, but also starting with that from a place where we can all able to. I think that was one of the most um, rewarding aspects. Well, I mean, that's that's fascinating. I, I must admit, I didn't I didn't know quite quite. I, I wouldn't have kind of guessed that point in that way, especially kind of having to do with the, the foundational element at the start, right? Uh, but you know, a couple of things that you were obviously emphasizing were the kind of openness, right? And you know. If, if we had to kind of apply jargon to this, the kind of co-design, right? 
in the way we we developed these lesson plans, right? Like, you know, uh, speaking from my perspective, you know, as someone, you know, I, I kind of deliberately chose to kind of work with you all because I don't have an expertise in the Caribbean. Uh, so I was, you know, on one hand, I was kind of interested to learn more about uh, one or more Caribbean writers, but the other, uh, on the other hand, I was also interested in kind of working more as a facilitator uh, of our discussions and of our kind of endeavor to create these lesson plans rather than someone that was kind of telling you what to do or something along those lines. And so, you know, going in, I was definitely kind of coming from a position of, you know, what do you all want to do? How are we going to organize this? And so it's, it's really kind of rewarding to kind of hear you echo that from, from the other side. Uh, in that regard too, it's worth emphasizing that we did try to kind of uh, moderate the amount of work that we were doing, you know, every two weeks so that it was manageable. You know, I often found myself after our meetings kind of, you know, listing out the things we had done and trying to kind of stress what was really essential. You know, there are often like two or three things that we wanted to get done. And then, you know, what might be called desiderata, right? Things that would be great to do, but it's okay if we kind of table them, didn't, don't quite get to them and table them for the next, till the next meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, Kira, how about you? Are there any uh, particular um, lessons that you want to share or kind of just insights from, from being part of our collaboration that you think are worth other people knowing as they kind of go into similar kinds of collaborations? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so firstly, I, I too, because I, I think I haven't said this yet, I did really find the collaborative aspect of this project super rewarding. And I think, you know, we can all, we all know that a lot of what we do is solitary. Um, so it, it was a really, really, particularly this year, it was such a welcome, such a welcome thing to do. Um, I think, so what helped, I think, for us, um, what made our collaboration really successful, I think, is that, um, Adrian, you did a really great job of this, and I think we all, you know, worked together to do this. We we all established our goals early, and we were on the same page about, like, some really key things. So, so one of the, you know, primary figures for establishing a sort of conceptual vocabulary for us um, ha has been Christina Sharp. And one of the phrases that, that Christina Sharp uses frequently is it, she always discusses, she, she talks about a, a past which is not past. Uh, and, and we all came to this project like understanding that our, our commitment was in approaching 19th century British literature as something that was not history, that was not past. And, and I think that that, because we started with that goal, all the kind of different logistics and all the kind of you know working out we did we never strayed from that, that shared goal. And I think that that, if I were to give like one piece of advice, if you're going to start a collaboration like this, is just to make sure that you really clearly like set out, you know, you're, you're really like big goals. Like what is the thing that you really want to do? Um, and I thought, you know, I thought everybody did a, everybody did a, a really fantastic job um, meeting the goal that we set for ourselves. No, that's great. And, you know, in, in some ways, what you're saying really echoes the uh, a point that Brie made us to start us off, made to start us off in that, you know, those, yeah, and again, this, this is something that never really occurred to me till I'm kind of hearing you all say it now is, is how foundational those early meetings were, yeah. were in establishing mm -hmm. various kinds of elements uh, that then kind of played out through the collaboration, whether it was the goals or the kind of openness or the kind of emphasis on co-design. Uh, and, you know, to kind of put that another way, like, it's, you know, one thing that I'm kind of taking away from this is it's really important to plan before you execute, right? Like we spent a fair amount of time just discussing what we were going to do, mm -hmm. uh, working that out, making sure, you know, we are all on the same page. And, you know, as, as Indu mentioned, this took some amount of compromise, right? Because we, as, 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 as scholars, we often work on our own, right? We make our own choices and that's it, right? We don't have to be kind of accountable, you know, to, to use a word one of you used to anyone. Uh, but this was a very different kind of process and that worked really well. Uh, so I think that's pretty much it for our discussion. Is there anything anyone else wants to add before we close? Okay, well, excellent. Well, I, you know, this has been a fantastic discussion. I mean, I've really kind of uh, enjoyed this recapitulation of our uh, collaboration, you know, as I've kind of cited a few times now, I've, I've learned some things I never realized despite working so intensely with you all. Uh, for so many uh, weeks and months, and, and hopefully you all have come, come away with a similar kind of feeling. Uh, but other than that, you know, th thank you very much for sharing your thoughts today uh, and for being part of this collaboration. You know, it, it, uh, I, from my perspective, it's been an absolute pleasure beginning to end. And, you know, I, I look forward to working with you all on something else in the future. So take care. Bye. Thank you. Sure. Bye.
拜拜。